please stand for a reading from the book of Acts. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you're determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted Jesus at the right hand as leader and Savior, that repentance be given to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these, witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to all who obey. The Word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. God. Please be seated. <coughs> Grace and peace be with you. Also with you. I am grateful to be found in the circle of mercy for many reasons, a host of reasons. For me, the first reason is that it has been restorative. We don't have a committee on committees here, <laughs> which appoints members to fill vacancies on 15 different committees. And yet somehow we still have a church. It still really is a church. I actually got our church committees down from 25 to 15. And I felt like LBJ in the kind of political maneuvering that it took to get that done. It's a great achievement. We also don't have a nominating committee, which appoints members to the committee on committees. I spent many years working in or near what I think we could call the industrial church complex. In brief, it's an exhausting system. And it's designed to maintain the church and the world it served as it was in roughly 1950. It seems to be dying just now, about which we hear a lot of worry. A more hopeful way of putting it is that God is killing it. <laughs> but it's not going down without a fight. You witness the anxiety, the reactivity of white Christian America right about now. The church in the industrial complex is a machine, and the people are interchangeable parts. I feel liberated from that complex here. It's a great gift. The church is a living body. It's not a machine has members, not parts. And its aim is wholeness. Another word for that is shalom. Another word for that is peace. Which brings me to a second thing for which I'm grateful to be a member of Circle of Mercy. And that is to be a member of a self-described peace church. I did not know if I would ever be able to be a member of a self-described peace, peace church. The industrial church is closely aligned with a social order known as America. After all, America is seen to be the hope of the world, which is exactly how President Obama described it in his acceptance speech for a Nobel Peace Prize arguing for the importance of American military strength in a speech about peace. America is seen as the hope of the world. Stanley Hauerwas taught me, taught me and is still teaching me to be wary of allegiance to America. He teaches that America is a social order 
It's held together by a belief that we really finally can share nothing in common except the fear of death. But the church is a different kind of social order. The church is a social order. And we hold more in common than the fear of death. In fact, we're animated by the fact that we're not afraid of death. We're held together by a belief that in Jesus Christ, God is at work healing, restoring, and making whole a creation that's at war with itself and at enmity with God and with one another. A church is an experiment in peace where we try to share in common with each other over the long haul, committing ourselves not to kill one another. Recognizing that our boundaries extend beyond this place. Every church is a bold experiment in peace. We can look forward to the day that we can just call ourselves a church and have it understood that a church means peace. But that may take a while. In the meantime, I'm grateful to be a member of this restorative, peace, risky church. It's the second Sunday in a great 50-day season called Eastertide. And today we meet the young church as it's on its way into the world, proclaiming the good news that the one whom we crucified has been raised with healing in his hands and peace on his lips. Forgiveness is offered and commanded. Repentance is called for in light of the resurrection. The Spirit is alive and large, making all things new. They don't set off to be a peace church, you might notice. They set off just to tell the good news of this resurrection and to learn how to live into the implications of it. It's worth noting that they have begun to share all things in common. There's no one in need among them. That's interesting. This is a social order freed from the fear of death, holding possessions in common, bearing witness that a new world is here. It's not just possible, it's here. The book of Acts is the story of their witness to what God's done and what God's doing. And it's also the story of the violent rejection of the world to their message. Today, the apostles are between their first imprisonment and their first flogging. Before they are dismissed from the room where they're speaking right now, they'll be whipped and sent off with another warning. They're standing before the high priests and the authorities who previously warned them not to speak anymore in Jesus' name, but they never promised to obey that commandment. In fact, they had said memorably, We cannot keep from speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard. So now the high priest says, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He won't say that name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Peter and the apostles reply in this riveting sentence, We must obey God rather than any human authority. Actually, I wonder if this might be a place where we can stick with the traditional reading. We must obey God rather than man. Or rather than the man. (laughs) Clearly differentiates God from maleness. I take it, having never been a member of an official peace church, I take it that's an important passage for a peace church. It's an important passage for all of us. We must obey God rather than any human authority. Young people, as soon as you are old enough to get a driver's license, you'll be faced with an opportunity to think about this. In North Carolina, When young men or trans women get a license for the first time, they'll be asked, as a routine matter of fact, to submit their names to the Selective Service Commission system. When you turn 18, 
you then have to register officially with the selective serv service or you risk being denied things like scholarships or even getting an ID issue. As I understand it, just this past February, a court ruling held that young women also must be asked to do this eventually. The Selective Service is a government agency that basically holds the names of 18 to 25 year olds in case a draft or required military service is ever reinstated. It also helps the military direct advertisement and marketing to you. President Carter created this entity. It's worth noting, after Russia invaded Afghanistan in 1980, it's highly unlikely that a draft will ever be reinstated in this country. But that moment, when you're asked to sign on the dotted line for selective service, it's a moment to reflect on this on the gravity of this line from Peter and the Apostles. We must obey God rather than any human authority. A peace church is a community of people who believe Jesus has been raised with healing in His hands, with peace on His lips, instructing us in the practices of forgiveness sending us into the world as He has been sent. And this will put us at odds with any social order that's united only by the fear of death. Grown-ups, we get to face this same challenge yearly, maybe quarterly, as we pay taxes which help build drones and nuclear weapons. There are those among us who can testify to the cost of this question. What we must, what does it mean to obey God rather than human authority? Once we say out loud that we are a peace church, we're no longer safe from questions like that. We also cannot remain silent about what we've seen and what we've heard from God about the possibilities of peace now and about the value and the beauty of every living creature. We're called to be witnesses in word and deed that the Spirit of God is at large in this world making all things new. That's what a peace church does. I have to confess that having never been a member of a peace church and only heard about it, I might have romanticized it just a little bit. I did this with farming until we actually try to live on one. And that's why I think it's a great gift that the Circle of Mercy includes Mennonites. I wonder if you would confirm that being a peace church is not a very romantic thing from day to day and week to week. Amen. That, in fact, it's a very down-to-earth, human, ordinary life full of the same frustrations as any church or any human community that includes the pain of division in the body. Perhaps you might also say that this is what peace looks like here around this table, in this room, living out over the long haul our commitment to be together I wonder if you can bear witness, after all, that peace is possible and real precisely because you've seen it lived out among flawed communities. In fact, through flawed communities, as we learn how to forgive one another. So let's take heart that today we were also told that story for the children of the original passing of the peace. This is the moment when ordinary, flawed, fearful, fractious people begin to take part in Christ's peace. It's one of the great wonders of Easter. How do people who are as violent as we are and as we're coming to see ourselves to be, how can we be made part of the peace of Christ? How can we be given the gift of passing the peace 
And that moment that our youth enacted for our children, that's when it began. They're locked in fear, calling one another names, their own people divided from their own people. And it's to people like that that Christ comes, forgiving, bearing wounds, calling us to forgive and speaking peace. The good news is that peace has already happened. It's not rooted in our goodness. It's not based on how we feel about the people in the room with us. It's not based on being a perfect church. One of the best things we can do toward being a peace church is to give up the quest for a perfect community and live in the community we've been given in the faith that God has made peace here and is making peace among us. It's been said that Shakespeare became a great playwright when the tension in his plays became internal to the hero. When the tragedy and the tension of the play became something embodied in the heroes, that's when Shakespeare came alive. That's when he became great. And that's when our piece gets interesting, too. When we recognize the, struggle, the struggles going on in us, not just in our enemies, that's when peace starts to get interesting. We pass the peace. We mimic the peace that was passed to us from Christ week after week because peace has been given to us. And it's not possible because we're good and righteous and moral people, but because has, God has refused to let our sin destroy us. It's possible, even for us, because Jesus Christ has been raised healing in his hands and peace on his lips. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.